The Long Way Home by Mike Saban. I'm going to quote from the front cover, when shit happens, it's a case of getting busy living or get busy dying. And this is what Mike has written on the back. On Anzac Day of 2009, my son, Daryl Saban, entered a fight for his life, one he was not expected to win, his love for rugby, propensity to suffer concussion, and fate had been on a collision course. One I was powerful to avoid. One I was powerless to avoid. Daryl survived emergency brain surgery, but I was told to say my goodbyes. I didn't. Instead, I told my son if he was still there, he needed to fight, and I would fight with him. The Long Way Home is a record of that fight. It is a raw and heartfelt account of the challenges faced in trying to piece together Daryl's shattered life. And while I was reading that, Mike reached out and held his son's arm. And it brought tears to my eyes because it's very, very emotional. Good morning. How are you, like well, I've known you for a while from Methcon days to uh, now Parliament, of course. And um, I was um, not witness to this, but you told me about this. You kept me updated mm. a- along the way. How victorious has this been? Uh, well, I guess the only difference between uh, tragedy and humour is, or, or, you know, is, is the time that lapses in between. And, you know, we can look back on a lot of it now and, and laugh. And, uh, you know, Daryl and I, I, I mean, part of it is, you know, you've got to find ways to cope because as I you know, said in, uh, in the book, it's, you know, basically when these sort of things happen, hope's about the only thing you have to cling to and you've got to find ways to make sure you don't let go. Um, so now, having come to the position that we are, where Daryl's, you know, about to sort of launch a, a new venture, and and this book, um, having written, uh, we'll put it together, has been quite cathartic, and uh, yeah, we're in a good place. Having read, um, having read Sir Graham Henry's introduction to it, or his forward, um, it was obvious you didn't have to, you didn't really have to ask him. He was probably offering to do it in the first place, but um, uh, this gives the book, this gives the book some some added advantage, unquestionably, does it not? Well, it does in the sense that um, you know, I mean, uh, Graham Henry is uh, synonymous with uh, success and 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 being a world champion in every sense of the word, in my yeah. view. And by some sheer twist of fate, uh, he had a relative in critical care beside Daryl. Uh, when Daryl was actually um, admitted into critical care and, and he learnt of Daryl's fate and was basically told that he was um, likely to die that evening. But he didn't. Daryl, um, tell, tell me the difference between you before this tragedy happened and now. Ooh. I was... Uh, again, I was... Uh, Oh, you name it, I would do it. Up power, up power. Yeah, I did it all. But I'm limited to the stuff I can do now, but it's getting back up there. What would you say the difference was? Um, well, the, the difference... I mean, obviously, I'm talking about an attitude yeah, to life yeah, and, and, and the way well, you approach the, things. The difference is that they're all... And, and that's really why he's put this um, speaking venture together is because w- what has run, what runs through Daryl, I think what runs through everyone, if you can tap into it and find it, um, is this, uh, is this you know, the human spirit of um, overcoming adversity. When everything else is gone, uh, you know, Daryl had that. He, that, was, that was all that he had to rely on was his stubbornness and where determination. Did, where did he get that from? Before you answer that, I can remember sitting in a Columbus coffee shop with you under the um, um, Metropolis building in, in, in the middle of town to talk about Methcon on this one occasion, because we had a few of those. And before we got to talk business, I had to be updated on Daryl. Mm. Uh, and um, the, the, you, know, you were going through some pretty, pretty emotional stuff, mm. stuff then. So where did he? Where did they go back to the question now? Where did he get this survival instinct from? Well, it's probably what contributed to his accident, and there's a sense of belief in himself. And actually, he he was he thought he was bulletproof, like every teenager. It's just that he um, he had this determined streak running through him, and I think that's the only thing that kept them alive. Yeah. And when they told us to say our goodbyes, I know my son, One and. Yeah, you, it was literally a millimetre away from death. And I, that's what I said to my son. Uh, I said, you know, if you're there, 
then then you, you got to fight. And if you if you're not, then go with my blessing because I didn't want him to play. I mean, that, make no mistake about it. I I had this horrible gut instinct that him and rugby were going to come a, a cropper. Well, I knew you'd, you you told me this that you know he'd had a, had a couple of bad bad goes, bad shocks, mm. um, head bangs, if you want. Um, and you were worried about him prior to it happening, and then it then it happened. Daryl, did you hear your dad say that to you? Were you aware that he said that to you oh, when yeah, you were unconscious? Heard, did you hear? Oh no, I heard before him, man. But uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was gonna do it regardless, cause I, But when you were unconscious after you had this mishap. And you were, and he was saying goodbye. Oh, I don't know. But you got to fight. Don't you don't know. He probably, he, I think he, he lost said about. Goodbye. No, no, no. But at the time, yeah. so what Lane's yeah. meaning is, at the time after you had the accident, do you remember anything from in that comatose oh, state? Yeah. And you basically lost about maybe four or five months. Yeah. No, no yeah. recollection whatsoever. The reason I ask that, I think, I hope it's obvious, but some some people actually do hear people talking to them, even though they say. The medical authorities say that they can't hear you, but but it turns out yeah, later that, that they did. Yeah, that was something I was wondering myself at the time. Yeah, I wonder if Daryl can hear me. He could hear me because when I said to him, "If you're gone, yeah. go with my blessing," but if you're not, you stay and fight. And I said, "You squeeze my fingers. I need to know you can hear me." And and he did. He squeezed him. And I said, "Now I want you to squeeze harder, so I know you can really hear me." He ne he nearly broke my fingers. <laughs> Um, and they said, oh, it's just a reaction thing. I know it wasn't. And seven days later, I think he was coming out of the coma and we were moving him and exercising him. And tears started streaming down his face. And I, and I said, my boy is in there and he's cognitive and he knows what's happened. And, he doesn't and, remember it, though. No. But, uh, but I, I'm with you. I, I, think he, I think he obviously did. He knew. He knew. My instinct, uh, absolutely, right. he knew. Monday the 3rd to Sunday the 9th of August. There are few words to adequately express the horror that we all went through for the first few weeks of this most deeply rooted test of the human spirit. It's still so raw that I can't bring myself to read the postings I made in those early days and weeks. So scared am I that the horror we faced will somehow claw its way back to the present. But now, some three and a half months down the track, as each day passes, the footprint of improvement and tentative return to normality seems to hide, at least in part, the path we walked in those early days. Just one of the, one little extract from uh, from Mike's postings um, with regard to uh, uh, this this tragedy. Well, it wasn't the tragedy; it might have been, of course. But how long after he came out of the coma did the rehabilitation start? Uh, well, he was he was in critical care for a week, and then in the um, high dependency unit uh, for brain injured people for three weeks, and. After four, after that four weeks, so basically he still hadn't opened his eyes. He was not really moving or doing anything. They thought he might be locked in, which is the horror of all horrors. You start Googling brain injury, and it's a very frightening experience. Uh, my instinct was, I mean, we were predicting rugby scores, but then he was completely cognitive in my view. I just found a way to communicate with him. He moved after a month to cave at ABI, which is a serious brain injury rehabilitation centre. He was the most seriously injured they'd taken at that time. I figured um, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so basically from they pretty much... two years to five or three of them to get out. Yeah, that's right. They said basically you may be there for two or three years, he may never leave this place. And I just said to Daryl when we got there, I said, mate, the only way we're leaving here is if you're walking. And so the quicker you get on your feet, the quicker we're getting out of here. And 146 days later, we walked out of that place. And it was simply because I just, every opportunity to move, to find a way to get to... I just thought of it like a computer latent. The hard drive had crashed, you know, the files were still there, but we had to connect the files back to the computer. And sure enough, we found a way to get just about everything going again, including his speech. Which So where are we at now? Where are you at now, I should say? Where are you at now with with this? Is there further progress to make? Or have you have you reached the the, the, the point of, of you, you can't go any further? Well, well you, you chip in and answer this as well, Darrell. Where do you feel you're at? You still making progress? Yeah, still making continued progress. I, don't. I, I think the thing is, they say you know about eighty percent of your gains you get in the first two years, and then after that, the, um, you know the last twenty percent is going to take eighty percent of the time. Yeah. Um, Daryl, he's uh, at the gym, you know, most days. Basically, his his days is made up of rehabilitation, and he just keeps on going. I mean, a year after this, when we're back at home, so we went home after six months, we went straight into the gym. Within six months of being home, this kid was squatting 160 kilos. 
you know, and he could virtually struggle to walk to the gym. But um, the point is, he's got a big battery, a big heart, self determination. Yep. And uh, all I needed to do was make sure that that was channeled into rehabil rehabilitation activities. And all right, so tell me about the the project. The well, the, yeah, yeah. So well. Um, about 80 months ago, um, Daryl and I sat down and thought, well, you've got to make something good of a bad situation. And uh, we thought he had a lot to tell on his story in terms of overcoming a challenge. And so we thought, why don't we put some sort of a presentation together? It becomes part of his rehab to be able to get up in front of a crowd of people and tell his story. I just happened to have hundreds of hours of footage of his rehabilitation from him being a completely immobile vegetable through to in the gym, uh, working out like you'd never know there was any difference. And while his speech is a bit slow, we've now got a 45-minute presentation that's called Shit Happens that pretty much um, you know, talks about the five life lessons that he's learned that I actually think are relevant to every life, but um, it's part of Daryl's recovery as much as a way to reach out to people and actually say, you know what, um, we all face challenges. You can either you know, get busy addressing it or get busy turning away. No. You've got a spot. Right. Well, with a title like we like you've decided on for it, why don't you get Kleenex or someone? To sponsor yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. At least to say there was plenty to clean up when that particular shit happened. But, uh, but yeah, look, it's a it's a, the book. I wrote a blog along the way just to keep people informed of how Daryl was progressing, and the book is really, in essence, that is that blog. I don't want to I don't want to run out of time without without promoting this. Um, let me tell you, you won't read this book without um, without needing a box of um, of tissues beside you. This, um, I, I would defy anybody to do it. Where can you get the book? Uh, well, at the moment, um, Daryl's selling the book through his website, which is um, 1090.co.nz, which is the number 10 and the word 90.co.nz. And those who go to his presentation um, can buy it, at, uh, you know, from him at his presentation. Um. So on the website, which is again, dub 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 dot ten ninety the number ten the word ninety dot co dot nz. And then there's a the, there's a bookmark comes with the book, Daryl Sabin's five lessons. Do you know I'm off by heart? Oh, no. Do you want to read them? Yeah. I, I I can yeah. I can give you give him yours. You read it and then I'll do the explanation. Number one. Shit happens. That's life. It's not fair. Get used to it. Lesson two, trust your gut. Learn to listen to it. Lesson three, your goal determines your outcome. Aim at nothing and that's exactly what you'll get. Aim at nothing and that's exactly what you'll get. Yep. Lesson four, pass the test of you. Get busy living or get busy dying. Lesson five, the 1090 rule. Life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you react to it. Get busy living. Get busy living. Isn't it, isn't it true, though, that we, most of us, the majority of us by far, take life for granted? You've got to wake up in the morning, you've got to have your day, and you've got to do the stuff, and you go to bed, and you get up the next morning, and it's just, you become, it becomes, it's like putting one foot in, the other, in front of the other to walk. Yeah. You don't even think about it, it's just life. And we don't think about it, I don't, I don't think about life enough mm. to extract the best and most from it. Yeah, and uh, something like this certainly helps uh, you focus the mind. But and the reality is, in my belief, everyone has the you know shit happens to everyone in some way, shape, or form, and and it's really what you do about it that's going to determine life ahead for you. Not not what's happened, but how you react to it. Exactly. Well, that's the saying. It's not what happens to you; it's how you what you do with it. How do people get in touch if they want Daryl to come and? Who are you aiming at? Anybody? Um, well, I mean, obviously we want to, Daryl's story can't help but highlight the nature of head injury and better understand that. But his story is intrinsically linked to the All Blacks because Daryl will become essentially the 23rd man of the squad. So yeah. there's a natural home there for a sporting audience. But in terms of the corporate audience or those, um, like his first presentation, we actually, uh, next Tuesday, is to a group of um, health care providers. Um, it's a generic message, you know, and it's it's all so about anybody, dealing anybody with anybody who wanted to to talk about having Daryl come address them. Yeah, gets just, in touch how? Just get a get a hold of us through the website. The phone is Daryl's phone number's on the website, but best thing is just to flick him through an email to um, 1090.co.nz or you know obviously people know how to get a me uh, get a hold of me. Certainly, if they want to talk about Snapper, they do. Anyway. No, it's, uh, it's it's the number ten. It's the numbers. So it's www. One zero, so www.10 and then 90 is written, the word 90.co.nz. 
Yeah. If you want to buy the book, you get it off the website. And um, like I say, it's um, it's a it's a read. Yeah, and look for those that um, uh, you know, and Willie, we've had some stuff going recently, and uh, my heart goes out to them. But it's again, it's what you do about yeah. it that matters. Daryl, thanks, mate. Yeah, thanks to you. And Mike, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Good to uh, good to be here.